Hi everyone, my name is Lexi Abrams and I'm one of the co-directors for Generation Ratify New Jersey. We are the state chapter of Generation Ratify, a national youth-led organization that strives for gender equality, specifically through the ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment. Just to give a little background on myself, I got involved with Generation Ratify at the beginning of this year. I'm also the membership director for New Jersey High School Democrats and I'm a campaign fellow on Congressman Tom Malinowski's re-election campaign. Thank you all so much for taking the time to be with us here today. I'm so excited to be moderating this webinar today in which we will have three panelists discuss discussing the Hulu series, Mrs. America, including the women's liberation movement and the fight to ratify the ERA. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Katie Brennan. Hi everybody, my name is Katie Brennan and I serve as the treasurer for Now New Jersey. And by day, I am, I am the chief of staff for the New Jersey Housing and Mortgage Finance Agency. I ensure that every New Jerseyan has a safe, healthy, affordable place to live. And I'm a volunteer sexual violence reform advocate. Thank you so much. Um, and next, here is Judy Buckman. Buckman, I'm Craig Keen of Factors I was called Factors. Our area covers the area of New Jersey from Trenton to Cape May. And I've been involved um, for about 40 years as a mayor, and I currently serve as president. Thank you so much. Um, and finally, Kayla Holmes. Hi, my name is Kayla Holmes. I also work as a state director for Generation Ratify um, New Jersey. I help alongside my co-director, Lexi, who's moderating, um, you know, kind of work on women's legislation, women's rights, gender rights, gender representation. Outside of um, Generation Ratify, I also work as co-president of my school's gender equality movement. And and outside of that, I also work on my own organization, FemNeuro, to combine women's representation in STEM as well. Thank you guys so much for being here today. Um, so I'll just get started with the first question and we can kind of get right into it. Um, also, I just wanted to quickly mention to the audience that we have time for questions near the end. So if anyone has questions, you can put them in the chat. Um, and then in terms of the discussion, we can kind of just do like a popcorn style type of thing. So whoever wants to um, kind of jump in and go first, you can do that. Um, so the first question that I wanna start off with is how do you think um, that the organization Stop ERA would have fared in today's political climate? I think it does exist in today's political climate, and there's so much just like talk to women, and large group of people who are working against their own best interests. Um, behind the scenes, Stop Up ERA was funded by the National Association of Manufacturers and the National Chamber of Commerce because they didn't want to pay women equal wages. Talk to Women is undoubtedly funded by the other right groups and talk with a few names so you never know what they stand for. They're, they're real intense. And those radical groups today are still working against the rights of women and people of color. If you look at Phyllis and Tony to a second envelope in her living room, there were no women of color. The only black woman in Phyllis's house was her maid and housekeeper who made it possible for her to go out and do her thing. Um, and accordingly, when you look at Trump rallies, all you see the white faces, and I don't think that's any coincidence. It's also no coincidence that at the end of her life, she actually supported Trump, and he even attended her funeral. Thank you so much, Judy. I think we're having a little trouble hearing you. Um, so if there's some way you could like hold your, um, like your headphones up to your mouth so you could possibly, um, so we could probably hear you a little better. Do you want to touch that? Is this better? Yes, that's yes. much better. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Can I replay it or just let it go? <laughs> Perfect. Um, Do it I feel again. <laughs> yeah, if you want to just recap your answer a little bit, because I heard okay. a little bit of it, but yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. What I said was it does exist in today's political environment, like groups like Women for Trump, a large group of women who are working against their own best interests. Um, behind the scenes, Stop BRA was funded by the National Association of Manufacturers and the National Chamber of Commerce because they didn't want to pay women equal wages. 
and Women for Trump is undoubtedly funded by right-wing groups and PACs with uh, obscure names so you'd never know their real intent. And those radical groups today are still working against the rights of women and people of color. If you look at Phyllis's cronies who were stuffing envelopes in her living room, there were no women of color. The only black woman in Phyllis's house was her maid and housekeeper who made it possible for her to go out and do her, her thing. And accordingly, when you look at Trump rallies, all you see are white faces, and that is no coincidence. It's also no coincidence that at the end of her life, Schlafly supported Trump, and he even attended her funeral. So they were best buds. Just to bounce off of what Judith said, I was going to say I completely agree in the sense of like, I remember at the end of the show, I was talking about how Phyllis was alive at the beginning of um, Trump's campaign. And I thought that was a big key point. And would that organization or something similar to be successful nowadays, if that legacy has been living on even into the times that we are currently living in. I think that that's kind of telling of the fact that these people are still around, people who are against um, kind of liberal viewpoints, against progression, against progressivism are still thriving to this day. So I think that's kind of a key point in which they would still be successful nowadays in some aspects. Absolutely. And the only thing that I would add to what you both so eloquently said was that Phil Schlafly was fighting not for change, but to keep things the same. And I think that that is still very much the same language that we hear today. Um, keep it the way that it was, go back to the way that it was. And um, she, it seemed like she was fighting for something, but really it was for status, for status quo, even though she, well, I'm sure we'll get to this, really used it for her own um, power building. And, but it's, to me, it's a lot of the same. It's, it's white fragility. It's this um, constant feeling of being threatened. And that, and that scares yeah. me, frankly, that it, that it is so similar. And in many ways, I think um, the women's movement manifests differently these days. And it may not be as such overt political power as perhaps they, they once had, um, but I, I think that addressing those intersectionality and, and some of the problems which were highlighted in the show, um, <clears throat> you know, that we're trying to reckon with today. Yeah, for sure. Um, everyone totally touched on all the points that I was thinking of um, myself. Um, and I think just to kind of build off of that, and I think Katie kind of touched on this a little bit, um, in that like um, Schlafly, a lot of what she did was super independent and she kind of had that autonomy in her life, um, which she's kind of fighting against at the same time. Um, so this is kind of like the big question that the series kind of um, portrays and like um, explores. And so the, my question to you is, do you believe that Phyllis Schlafly was a hypocrite? Absolutely. Even, even though she said that she was doing God's work, she wasn't willing to give women the other the liberties that she enjoyed and demanded for herself, like traveling all over the country, using her sister as a nanny to raise her kids and going back to law school. She was also a hypocrite in her personal life as she realized early on that her son John was gay, but she continued to believe and espouse that being gay was a sin. I have to say that as much as I despise Phyllis and what she stood for, I have to admit that my heart went out to her when after all she had done to elect Ronald Reagan, he chose Jean Kirkpatrick, a feminist, to serve in his administration, a job that she was convinced she deserved and was positive she would get. So that was kind of heartbreaking other than that. <laughs> that, that, that scene really capped for me that she, you know, foreign policy was her expertise and that's what she'd been working in. And when that was deemed an inappropriate avenue for her as a woman that she sought out power else, wherever she could, she get it. And um, I, I thought that was kind of a nice tie in, I, I suppose, reality, but also reflected in, um, in the show when that is what she wanted. And she was working to build to that place, however she however she could, but yes, she did not bring anybody else with her and um, really just stood on the shoulders of the patriarchy to to get where she wanted to go. Right, I think so too, in the sense of like, especially when I watched the show, I said, 
Phyllis was kind of, you know, whether she wanted to believe it or not, she was kind of like a feminist in her own right, in the sense of like, she was going out. She was, even when you saw it towards the end, when her husband was like introducing himself as Mr. Phyllis Shapley, just as a joke, that's kind of what it became. And when you saw that, um, even the women who were working with Phyllis, they were like, you're working girls now, you know, whether you like it or not. I think Phyllis was although she was pretending to put on this mask i'm fighting against women's equality and fighting against women's rights she was kind of just like at the forefront of becoming her own woman the whole time and kind of abandoning those homemaking attributes and those kinds of things um yeah thank you guys so much um and i think the next question that kind of like dovetails into this topic um, is why do you think that Schlafly was so anti ERA? Like, what was the thing that was driving her besides the fact that, like, as Katie mentioned, it was like one of the things that was able to get her into politics? Like, what do you think was the ulterior like, motivation behind that? I, I think for the same reason that anti choice protesters are so determined to impose their beliefs about contraception and the right to choose abortion on other people who don't share their beliefs. They think God is on their side and they think they're doing God's work on this earth. Um, a lot of times in the series, you could see flinches of anger and awareness on Phyllis's face when she became aware that she was being ignored or dismissed or talked down by the men that she do so desperately wanted to impress and collaborate with. But then you see her swallow that awareness and take whatever action she thought she needed to do in order to get their approval, like appear in a bikini as part of a fashion show that was the first scene of the series. I mean, that to me is pretty much said it all. I mean, Go ahead, Kayla. <laughs> I was going to say, I feel like she, like, I think, you know, we're all in agreement that she kind of used that as her avenue to get into politics in the sense of when the foreign policy stuff wasn't working out, like you previously mentioned, she definitely was like, well, this is gonna be my end. I'll take the opposing side to this ERA battle. I feel like as the story progressed because Phyllis was gaining a lot more power, I'm not gonna say she 100% changed her ideals and was totally immersed in this idea of like being, you know, a, you know, not necessarily a dominant woman, but I think that she became more intrigued by the role and more immersed in that role she was playing because it gained her more popularity, it gained her more followers. So even when she was talking to her friend and she was like, well, you know, you know, your husband is mean to you, but you know, you didn't marry him for this reason. So you just, so just suck it up. I think she was really into this role because she noticed she was gaining followers. She was gaining praise and people were listening to what she had to say if she played along. you know i can't i can't know into her mind but i i don't know that she was anti ear right <laughs> i think it's what she latched onto as her as her vehicle um to to rally people around and on to the detriment of us all <laughs> um yeah guys thank you so much um and just to reiterate if anyone in the audience has any questions that they like think of off the top of their head um while we're discussing Feel free to put that um, into Facebook, into the chat, um, and we will see it and we will um, have, have those questions answered at the end. Um, but just to keep on continuing, um, and then Katie kind of touched on this just a little bit, but what do you guys think ultimately led to the failure ERA? Because we see throughout the series, there's like a bunch of little different things that all contribute to the fall, but what do you think was like either the main thing or just like the person or something besides maybe Phyllis, um, that contributed to the downfall. In the beginning, I'd say it was naivete. Na we all thought if we just clearly explained the need for an equal rights amendment, the legislators that we were approaching would you know, slap their foreheads and say, of course, we get it. Uh, it was all terrible oversight and lack of awareness on our part. Of course, the amendment has to be added to the Constitution. I also think that we were victims of some very successful divide and conquer techniques. In the series, you see so many instances of feminists being divided by racial issues, by sexual identity issues, by class issues. So the effort ended up mainly being fought by white, straight, middle class women. And then we got in trouble for that. People said, yeah, they're just a bunch of white, middle class women. You're such a small demographic. You don't re represent me or the rest of the country. 
And then finally, as the throat said to Woodward and Bernstein when they were investigating the uh, Watergate scandal for the Washington Post, he told them, when in doubt, follow the money. And he was right. In the case of the ERA's defeat, it looked like it was all due to Phyllis Schlafly, but it was really the money that was provided by the National Association of Manufacturers and the National Chamber of Commerce, who funded her solely because they didn't want to pay equal wages to women. They held the biggest piece of the pie, and they were not about to share it. Watching that saga unfold, it made me think a lot about the work that we're doing now and how, you know, upholding the system and the patriarchy and the status quo is is always easier than, than fighting against it. But what is it that, you know, where are you following the money for, for good? What is the long-term power building that we're doing now? What are the things that we're not just trying to hold on to, but what do we stand for? Where do we need to go? Is it, you know, is it childcare? Is it affordable housing? Is it all the number of things that have a disparate impact on women? You know, is it elected seats um, in Congress so that we are represented and hold power? Is it building new power structures altogether? I, I thought a lot about that and about, um, you know, if you, you saw some of the articles about this show and how, okay, Okay, well, to this day, you know, Gloria Steinem ends up on the magazines and, and that's great. Um, but I, it made me think of, okay, what are we doing today that's <clears throat> performative or that's, you know, flashy, but is getting in the way of our long-term strategy to make sure that we are, um, not to say that that's what they were doing necessarily, but it's like they were holding on to advancements that were so fragile in the grand scheme of things um, and kind of our our, his, our nation's history. Um, so I, that doesn't totally answer the question, but that's the, its failure and its kind of rise again has made me think of, okay, what what is it going to take to recreate that kind of strong momentum. Right. I think um, I agree. And I think it's kind of like two aspects that I saw at least unfold in the story. One is just like you said, there's just so many avenues that people could take and so many components that have to go into this. And then another thing was just the divisiveness between the parties in terms of like, firstly, there were so many issues that they wanted to cover, like gay rights, um, you know, rights for women of color, a lot of, you know, childcare, abortion, and not everybody wanted to agree on that. Even when you saw sometimes some of the women in the group were abandoning gay rights, like we we're not going to bring it up because it would just kind of inhibit us from getting this ERA passed. I think there were so many things that everybody wanted to include because everybody should be represented, but that made it really difficult for it to be like palatable, I guess, to the general community. And then the other thing was like, even you could see at the end where how the Democrats and the Republicans like kind of came together to uphold this, but there was more of a divide between conservative and between liberals. So I think that further divisiveness is even why we're still struggling with like women's rights and gender rights and like POC equality today. I think those are the two big aspects. <laughs> Um, and kind of Kayla just touched on this a little bit in terms of like the palatability of their movement and their ideas. Um, so we see in the series that um, Bella Absbug um, kind of struggles with like how to present their ideas and like whether they should like stay um, to their like true um, motivations at the very beginning of the movement or if they should become more moderate to kind of appease um, more of elected officials. Um, so do you uh, do you think that this was a mistake on their part to get like become more moderate and kind of sacrifice some of their ideal ideas in order to appease um, elected officials, or do you think that it was like beneficial to them to kind of um, to to take that step? Bella was a wonderful woman and a wonderful leader. Um, if she became more, more moderate over time, it was probably because she was worn down by the... Oh, thank you. It was probably <laughs> because she was worn down by the harsh realities, compromises, and accommodations that she needed to make in order to run for office. People often ask why I don't run for office, and I always say because I couldn't withstand what you have to do when you're running for office. First of all, you can't be caring, sensitive, soft-spoken, 
um, care about everyone's dignity. And if you don't believe me, just ask Jimmy Carter, who got chewed up and spit out by the politicians that he had to work with. Um, Bella, I think, started out with the strong values and principles intact, um, given that one of her first cases as a young lawyer was representing a poor black defendant in uh, Mississippi or some other deep south state. Um, she was pregnant at the time. And as a result of harassment, she had to get out of town so fast, I think she had to do it in the trunk of a car. So over the years, I don't doubt that she learned a lot of painful lessons that to get things done in politics, you have to go along to get along. That didn't make her less of a feminist. It certainly didn't make her less of an activist or a leader. It just made her a better uh, politician who was more likely to get elected and on the downside, I guess, being seen as more moderate. Yeah, I think it's, I think we still, st we struggle with this all the time of, you know, are we going to have some sort of purity test we talk about when we talk about politicians? And, and I think it's, there's a pragmatism that yes, you know, you're never going to always, if you're an elected official, you're never going to get your way. And in theory, you're representing your constituents. And so sometimes you're going to have to do what, what they believe or what is best for them. Um, but I think kind of both roles are important of, okay, you're going to have somebody who's going to be a pragmatist and, and compromise and, but also maybe that means that they're going to deviate from their ideals. And then you're going to have somebody that, you know, you see this when we talk about like Bernie or something, it's like, okay, who's going to pull us in that direction? And then who's the person that's going to manage to break through and, and get it done? Um, you know, and, and that's not to say that both can't get it done or that both can't have those ideals, but I, you know, I, I think it's sometimes a little, un, a little unfair. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I think, um, like in terms of for Bella, like, it was beneficial like you know the question was like was it beneficial to them i mean it was beneficial to her and her party it wasn't you know beneficial to every single person i guess who was aligning with their views and aligning with this movement but i think it was beneficial because it did make you know i guess more people involved in the political sphere like we said palatable like people you know are going to agree with them more if they are going to conform to what they want and a less you know in your face i guess version of what the era meant i think i agree like nowadays we still have that a lot of people felt like bernie was radical and those kinds of things i didn't necessarily agree but i think we still have that nowadays we're not everybody's ready for change not everybody's ready for change to come so extremely like just so fast so they want um things to be slow i mean i think we need change fast but not everybody's okay with that so it's uh, you know it's like a continued theme from now even into 2020. Um, thank you guys so much. Um, and I think another question, um, and we see this towards the end of the series um, at the Women's Convention in Houston. Um, so there's like a bunch of different storylines going there. But for me, at least, the one that stood out the most was um, with Phyllis's friend, Alice, um, who kind of had that whole experience where she like um, met that woman at the, at the bar and then she kind of like went around discovering all the different like um classes and like different things that were happening at the convention and you kind of see like in her mind um her changing views um considering like the array and all that type of stuff and then we also see that um when she gets back home and like she gets the job at the very end um and kind of like rejects some of the ways that phyllis like does her teaching and also how phyllis reacts to um the um, the other woman who um, ha was having trouble with like her abusive husband. Um, so do you guys, um, I, I kind of like the question is, why do you think that Alice was like reconsidering her anti-ERA stance during the convention? I think Alice slowly realized how much she was unknowingly giving up by fully, fully accepting Phyllis's uh, traditional female stereotype that she demanded all of her followers um, it's funny that you brought up that scene. That was my favorite scene in the whole series when Alice sat next to the older woman at the bar to have a drink and they were having a heart to heart about their experiences at the convention. While that scene was playing, I knew that that older woman was a now member 
but Alice didn't realize it until the end of the conversation, at which point she abruptly got up and walked away. But I think that conversations like that were the catalyst for women like Alice to realize exactly what they were giving up by Phyllis's doctrine, um, including control over their bodies, um, an inability to earn a living that would make them financially independent, and an inability to run for political office or exert any kind of political control over their lives. I think as those issues loomed in front of them, they kind of thought back to what they had heard from feminist leaders and thought, maybe they weren't so wrong after all. Yeah, I think it just, it wasn't serving her. You know, she um, was coming from a place of fear. And I think she says, as I know she's the, the Sarah Paulson character is a composite character in the story, but she's it's coming from a place of fear, and and she realized that she didn't want to exist being scared, and um, yeah, and then it's like what what was Willis actually getting for her, you know? <laughs> and she's just pulling the ladder up behind her and and not allowing um, Alice to to grow. Mm -hmm. I agree. I think that was also when she's walking through the convention and checking out all the booths, that was my favorite scene in the movie or excuse me, in the series as well. I think that I think hearing the other girl's story, especially how she didn't want her husband to know where she was, and it was like all this stress and all this fear, I think she kind of sympathized with her. And even watching her like journey just throughout the convention, it really reminded me of like my own personal experiences of feminism. Like as somebody who's raised in the church and who's also still very religious, I think that I was also experiencing the way Phil Phyllis was telling her like lies about feminism, lies about the ERA, those kinds of things, and just kind of women's equity and women's equality in general. So I think her story was very like personal to me, seeing how she explored things on her own and was able to discover things on her own. I think that's why she made that transition. And I like really resonated with that as well. Um, yeah, thank you guys so much. Um, and we're, in terms of prepared questions. Um, I've gotten into like the very end of it, but I'm just like thinking about what we're all talking about um, with kind of like Phyllis's, um, I don't want to call them like cronies, but they, they kind of were that like those, that small group of women who like were always in her office and like followed her around. So it was Rose, um, Alice, and then I, the name of the woman with, um, with the abusive husband, her name slipped my mind. Um, but they all kind of have like different roles within Phyllis's life. Um, so if you guys could just speak a little bit to maybe like which one of them do you think um, had the most impact on you and like why do you think that their role was like portrayed um, as it was in, in the series? For me, I think it was the young mother. I was a young mother while this was going on. Actually, I was breastfeeding my daughter at the first now convention I ever went to. <laughs> and so I kind of had a dual life. I had a life and I was a breastfeeding counselor so I had this du dueling life as a young mom with kids doing all that that involved and I was also very active in the um, ERA movement and it was almost like um, you had to choose like you couldn't talk about the baby when you were at a now meeting and you couldn't talk about now when you were at the breastfeeding meeting and so I really really related to the character who's struggling with that. I'm trying to think about it. it this is it wasn't one of the particular characters but i have um maybe a, a slightly interesting perspective in that i grew up in st louis and um i went to high school with the liberal wing of the schlafly family <laughs> <laughs> that own the beer company. You can look it up. There's a, they own um, like a microbrew company and, and Phyllis Schlafly, while she was still alive at one point tried to block them from naming the beer company that because she felt like she owned the name, which I think just speaks to that it was her brand identity. You know, this is her power. It's her name. It wasn't about ERA or anything else, but um, needless to say, she lost and uh, that battle. And there's to this day, a um, uh, wonderful St. Louis company called Schlafly Brewing. But <laughs> that, that's, um, 
I, I think that yeah, being being raised in um, the St. Louis area, which is super Catholic, and going to Catholic school, and um, and seeing some of those dynamics play out, and um, some of the kind of language and approach that the various characters took, um, it just it felt very familiar to me. <laughs> though I would, though I was not. I would say I, I was not alive. For it. <laughs> Um, I would say, I mean, I feel like I did. Answer, I feel like I did answer this question when I said like I resonated with her journey with feminism. Like as I was thinking just now, I feel like I also could resonate with Phyllis a little bit in the sense of like she had to do a lot just to get to where she was, um, a lot to kind of like you know not necessarily come fully out with like being a dominant woman and being you know a woman in a powerful position. I feel like especially when they were having that conversation about how. The one woman was telling her how she had to kiss up to a lot of people, smile, not be so um, overbearing when she was around guys because she still wanted to, you know, maintain her position of power. I think that even being um, a high schooler, especially because there's so many organizations we participate in and we go to conventions and those kinds of things and conferences, if you're in certain organizations, I feel like with Phyllis, a lot of me and my um you know, girls that I'm friends with have talked about having to do that when we're at conferences, at conventions, because we don't want to seem too overbearing and we don't want to seem, you know, like we're just, you know, excited girls. Like we don't know what we're talking about. So I feel like I can identify with Phyllis in that sense. Um, awesome. And then I think, okay, so we have like 15 more minutes-ish um, and we're getting some questions from the audience. So I guess we can just get right into those and then we'll do more time at the end. Um, I'll like think of some questions off the top of my head. Um, but for the first question um, is specifically um, about now. Um, so our audience members asking, what is now doing to get out the vote? So I guess that'd be Katie, your point of view. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and I'll, oh, yeah, go ahead, Judy. Go ahead. South Jersey now is working closely with Andy Kim's campaign, even though we can't support him since we're a local group and he's a national candidate. A lot of our members, um, apart from now, are volunteering heavily in his campaign, um, doing voter registration, doing get out the vote, phone banking, um, helping to fundraise. So um, our members are doing it rather than our chapter because it's not appropriate for a local group to support a national candidate. but. We know okay. it's important, and we know he's being targeted. So, so um, he's he's got a target on his back. So we we absolutely want to support him. Yeah, I think that uh, generally the organization is is very supportive of getting out the vote. And as Judy said, we have to be a little bit careful. You can you can get out the vote. Um, you can't technically work for a, a particular person. That said, now does have a pack. Um, and so they they are able to do some political organizing through through that side of the organization. Um, but right, I think that that is should absolutely be one of our number one goals going into the fall. Yeah, for sure. Um, and then another question that we got, um, which was also in the back of my mind throughout watching the entire series, and I think. Um, there was like some public discussion of this as well um, after the series came out. Um, but the question is, do you guys think that the show was biased towards a specific viewpoint in that was it more sympathetic towards some character characters compared to others? I don't think so. I, a lot of people said in the beginning that it, they felt it was um, tilted towards like Kate Blanchett because she was one of the producers. And I, I guess I kind of felt that way in the beginning. But as the series went on and the um, groups between in, in, in the now and the um, other feminist groups became more apparent, um, I think it got more fair-minded, or at least it felt that way to me. I think so too, I think right? And I, I, I well, like. Oh, go ahead, Kill. Oh, wait, can you hear me? Okay. I was going to say, I think they showed both sides well. Um, 
like Phyllis and the more conservative women versus the more liberal women who are fighting for the ERA. I think I got the viewpoint, even when they had backstories for each woman, they showed their specific journeys. I think that it showcased both sides of the story well and showcased how each woman was kind of battling her own internal journey with feminism, even if they were on the conservative side. Absolutely. I think it would have been too easy to paint um, Phyllis Schlafly as just a one note villain. And that would, and everyone is a real person. And so I thought, it, I mean, if not in reality, it made for a lot better TV to, to have it to kind of show people's motivations a little bit more. But yeah, I, th I thought too, I was like, wow, like, am I going to be able to finish this in <laughs> the first couple episodes? But it did, it did add a lot more complexities as it went along. I guess I was a little disappointed that they didn't give as much um, breath to the to the diversity of Gloria Steinem. I felt she was kind of displayed as the attractive one, maybe the articulate one, but I just felt like her portrayal was pretty one-dimensional. I'm curious if there's going to be a season two, if there's going to be, okay, what? Well, yeah, what happens? Okay, so we didn't make it. <laughs> you know what? What happens now? And um, I mean, I, I mean, I would love whole spinoffs, like one entirely on Shirley Chisholm. You know, things like I think there's a there's a lot that uh, doesn't. Even if you know who these people are, I don't think they've really gotten a lot of play in terms of biopics or TV or movies. And I'd love to see more. I would too. My, one of my favorite characters was Florence Kennedy, the African American woman who wore the cowgirl hat. If you Google her, she was the most quotable person on the face of the earth. And easily, a series could be made about her alone. She and Gloria, <clears throat> excuse me, used to go out on the road often to talk. And um, one of the hecklers asked her if she was a lesbian. And she said, What? Are you the alternative? And. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, there, were, there were many characters that were much more colorful than were depicted in the series. So I agree with you, Katie. I'd love to see more um, blow out of, of the different characters. Yeah, I totally agree. I like, especially learning in school, like we barely touch on the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, and when we do, we kind of just like talk about it as like a whole homogenous mass of women, but we never really focus on like the specific women, except for like really glorious Steinem. Um, so like this show really opened my eyes to all like the important players um, that like I would have not have known otherwise without like doing some research on it. Um, so definitely like if you could do some sort of spin-off series with like each individual <laughs> character, I'd definitely watch that. And I'm sure a lot of people would too. So we can recommend it to Hulu. <laughs> Um, okay, and then we kind of talked about this a little bit at the beginning um, in, in talking about um, how Phyllis is fighting to be a homemaker while also full-time working in politics and also going to law school. Um, so just to kind of like talk about this a little bit more in depth, um, how do you make sense of the inherent irony in Phyllis's actions and ideas or like actions versus ideas? Sure. Could you repeat that? Yeah. Um, how do you make sense of the inherent irony in Phyllis's actions and ideas um, where she was fighting to be a homemaker while also working in politics full time and going to law school? Well, I think she was an ambitious woman from the start, but at the beginning of her life, she probably didn't realize that that was, you know, not a place, an appropriate place for her to be. But I think as she got involved in politics, especially um, the Cold War, she became aware that she had a brain, that it could be used for a good purpose. She erroneously believed that that would be a welcome thing. And I think that she um, kind of became a feminist, as somebody said before. Uh, I agree. I think that Phyllis, um, just kind of on her own, like we talked about before, just to reiterate, she definitely got a taste of like that power and the ability to utilize her resources like her brain utilize um the law the law school experience those kinds of things and really step outside of the home and make something of herself on her own so i think that even if she was kind of 
I think the fighting to be a homemaker, I'm sure it was like ingrained in her core values because that's how she grew up. But I think at the end of the day, it was just kind of put on the back burner, especially because at the end when she got that call that she didn't get approved to, you know, be appointed. I think that we could see that that was truly like what was going on in the background. That was kind of her ultimate goal, even though she had this forefront of one fighting for women to stay in the home. I think that was kind of like the ultimate goal. And when she got that taste of power that she could actually achieve something outside of the home, she was just using that kind of just like as a forefront, although she still believed in it somewhat. I agree. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Um, okay, so another question um, is how do you, um, why do you guys think that the series um, focused, I mean, it wasn't as much, um, but the series did spend a decent amount of time focusing on Phyllis's relationship with like her children. So we see um, with her son um, who was having trouble with his um, sexual um, orientation. And then we also saw with her daughter who went off to um, a more liberal college and was kind of like rebelling against her mom. And I think she ended up changing her name because she was so embarrassed by like the being um, known as like Phyllis Schlafly's daughter. Um, so why do you think that the series like spent time focusing on her children? Um, because like it could be that you kind of want to be more sympathetic to Phyllis and see like difficulties in her life, but it could also be that like we also show another way in which Phyllis is a hypocrite in that um, all of her ideas are kind of going against like her private life and what um, she really, like what is kind of her life is like, if that makes sense. Well, women uh, my age, Phyllis was older than me, but women of her generation and mine were taught that kids are your life, that you are, you know, to go to college, get a husband, have kids, end of sentence. And um, I, so I she fulfilled that, as did I. You know, she had a family and um, did all of the things that she was supposed to do. But I think that when it started concentrating on the kids, I think that was a sign that the generations were switching, that the younger people were no longer willing to accept that model, both sexually or in terms of power. That's why, you know, the daughter changed her name because she didn't want to be Phyllis Lapley's daughter. She wanted to be her own person. And, um, you know, I, I think the kids represented the next generation's change in beliefs and attitudes. Did anyone else want to speak on that a little bit? Um, um, I would say that I also want to I agree. I was just going to say the same thing, which is why I didn't say anything. I thought that it was just like showing that um, shift, I guess, especially because Phyllis, um, she, especially because we saw how long the ERA fight was, like it was spanning so many years. So I think Phyllis was trying to push it and push it and push it into each um, year, into each generation and pass those ideologies down to our kids and we like i like she said we could see that transition it was not necessarily as successful as she might have hoped it could have been because the fight was long and it was like her stance i guess was kind of diminishing along with um you know with her children i guess yeah and another thing we see is her relationship with her sister-in-law mm -hmm. um which is also really really interesting especially at the very end um, when they have that convention, um, because the ERA like wasn't ratified in time, um, and like her family's all at the table, and she recognizes her husband, and then she has all of her kids stand up, and her husband stand up, and, and her sister in law is the only one who's not standing up at the table, and like you see her sister in law's reaction to that. Um, so I just wanted to kind of hear your thoughts on the series and how they portrayed. Phyllis's um, relationship with this, uh, with the sister-in-law and like kind of what the sister-in-law represents. Yeah, yeah she was right, Katie. Um, <laughs> her sister-in-law, um, I think, didn't stand up because she was aware that she was the one who made Phyllis's life possible by um, caring for her kids and you know being her nanny. And if anybody deserved recognition at that table, it was her. And the fact that Phyllis didn't recognize her was cruel, 
you know, cutting. Um, and, and I think that would have been an acknowledgement that she couldn't have done it on her own. The fact that she had helped to do all these things um, would have made her less effective than she wanted to be. Maybe she was as insecure as Trump. Who knows? Maybe that's, maybe that's what they bond over. Yeah, I mean, she had, um, as you mentioned at the at the top of this, there was she had a lot of paid and unpaid labor in in her life, and I thought it was an interesting highlight of okay, you know, you you see her husband a little bit in it, and he kind of plays the role that women often do in other movies <laughs> of just sort of there as a, as the supporting character, and um, I, I think that. We've talked about this a lot and it came up actually at the beginning of the pandemic of oh you know people um newton wrote the theory of gravity and these people did this and all during the plague and it's like yeah and they also had people that were rearing all of their children and and cooking all their meals and doing all these things and and just the general acknowledgement that none of us get places alone and for phyllis to be doing it as a, as a woman and um it's like, yeah, she she needed help too to get all that done, and uh, I thought it was an interesting way to highlight that in, in particular. And she probably yeah. felt like uh, honoring her children was honoring her accomplishments. That mm -hmm. was, you know, what she was raised to yeah. be as her accomplishments, and so she was making them all stand up and say, "See, I did it the right way." Six, six kids, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. I think um, even when you could see like how you said from the beginning, Phyllis always had help, but like as she was moving up the ladder, I think she was kind of forgetting the people that helped her along the way. Even when she had that argument with her friend in the middle of the conference who was like a little bit tipsy and her friend was like, I feel invisible. You know, you didn't acknowledge me. You never said I helped you. I think Phyllis was um, just kind of forgetting the community that she came from and the people who were kind of the ones who totally propelled her career. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. No, she had so much help from all those women. Um, and she like, she acknowledged them in some ways in terms of like giving them things to do, but it's just kind of like to better herself um, to get and to give herself more power. Um, so it looks like we have like a couple minutes left. Um, so to kind of bring the conversation um, and kind of like reflect on the um, fight for the ERA back then, um, I wanted to ask you, what do you think that people should be doing or can do as individual people today um, to help advance gender equality and just get more involved in the fight um, um, for gender equality? And you guys can kind of speak to this based on like either your own personal experience or like with, within um, your organization that you're representing. Well, I believe that people should join organizations. I think there's a tremendous benefit in collaborative power. You can do so much as part of an organization, obviously, now is my organization, but it doesn't have to be that. It could be Planned Parenthood. Um, there's half a dozen groups that fight for things I believe in. And it's fine to write letters at your dining room table or make phone calls to your legislators. But when you join an organization, you have local, state, and national power behind you. And um, I, I've just felt that I've accomplished so much because I've been able to be collaborative. I, I like the way that you put that. And yes, I think that this is, is um, as we mentioned earlier, about the long game power building and how do you leverage one another in an organization? How do you be seen, be heard, put the pressure on, be represented and um, at all levels, whether that's organizational, whether it's in the state house, whether it's in Congress, um, whether it's being able to put pressure on policies and regulations. And so definitely, definitely an organization, but in terms of the um, movement for the ERA now, I think we're gonna to have to get a lot of very powerful people to either say that we're allowed <laughs> to accept it post deadline, or I mean, even RBG has said that we might have to start over because if you're gonna let people join after the fact, what about the, I mean, I don't know. I don't wanna start a whole thing there, but I think we need to, um, I think that we, there's been a lot of momentum behind various 
women and gender justice related movements the past few years. And we need to harness that power in order to um, see some real kind of political wins. Yeah, I agree 100%. I think like even um, in terms of my own knowledge about policy and legislation and my own fight for like feminism and gender equality, I wouldn't have been able to do half the things that I have done so far without joining an organization like Judith said. So I think joining an organization, Generation Ratify has helped um, just me and my partner Lexi, I think do so much and work so much on policy and um, work with our national team and those kinds of things. And I think it's phenomenal just to have a group of um, people who share the same vision as you. And I think even Generation Ratify, the girls who started it were really successful helping um, the area get ratified in Virginia a little while ago. So I think that, um, especially like this is an intergenerational conversation. So we can see my generation, your generation, your generation, it's all something that's being passed on and we're still working towards it today. But I think having that backbone of an organization is really important. And even just, like I said, me and my friends work as co-presidents um, next year for our school's um, gender equality movement. Just if you can't do an organization, um, just creating outreach and creating momentum around it, even like at a local level is important too. I, I neglected to mention something. I'd be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to the Alice Paul Institute. Um, Alice Paul was the author of the Equal Rights Amendment and um, our chapter's name for her, but there's another group called the Alice Paul Centennial, the Alice Paul Institute, and they have a wonderful toolbox of ERA materials um, and resources and experts and um, there's no sense in reinventing the wheel. Um, if you go to alicepaul.org, you will see a ton of things that has been done on the ERA, is being done on the ERA, will be done in the ERA. And um, I'd love to see people join that group as well. Yeah, yeah I've definitely, I have read some of those things about like kind of um, how far the ERA can like impact people um, on the Alice Paul website. And it's, it's fascinating to see how much the ERA can do for like people of all genders, all sexual orientations. Um, it's really amazing to see. Um, so definitely recommend checking that out. Um, but it looks like we went a little bit past eight. So I think um, if no one else in the audience has any questions, um, speak now or forever hold your peace. Um, but I just wanted to thank you guys so much for taking the time to um, speak about Miss America as, as well as fight for gender equality. Um, I definitely learned something and kind of got some new insights into the series that I definitely did not get watching it for the first time. Um, and I'd just like to thank Now New Jersey for co-sponsoring this event along with um, Generation Ratify. Um, and for anyone in the audience who missed um, something that we said or just want to share this with other people, um, we will be posting a recording of this discussion on Facebook, which is where most people are watching now, and then also on YouTube for Now New Jersey, both of which um, will be pretty accessible I think, within the next um, day or two days or something like that. Um, so I just wanted to thank everyone again for participating in the discussion. It was so, so um, important to kind of like speak about um, this issue and also to hear a bunch of different generational perspectives. Um, so thank everyone in the audience for listening. Um, we really appreciate it and we hope that you learned something as well. Um, but I think that's basically it. So thank, thank, thank you, you guys so much. Me. Yeah, of course. Thank thank you. Well, I'm very tickled yeah. to, be the, to be the middle in this <laughs> intergenerational discussion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. I'm um, not sure.